thank you all for attending this virtual event organized by Word Up Community Bookshop. We're a bookshop and art space run by local residents, many of whom are volunteers. Uh, when we're not experiencing a pandemic, we can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street in the Heights. Uh, we normally host daily events for all ages and sell used new books in English and Spanish. Um, and so when we're out of the pandemic, we hope you'll be able to visit us uh, for our events, but we do have a host of virtual events um, that are still going on like this one. Uh, I'm so glad to be able to continue to provide those things. Um, so we're, we've also partnered with the census to remind our community of how important getting counted is. Billions of dollars are at stake for New York, money that goes to schools, infrastructure, housing, and healthcare. Um, so we encourage everyone here to take their census at my2020census.gov um, and check in with loved ones to make sure that they filled out the census and their preferred languages. It comes in uh, a wide variety of, oops, I meant to put that to everyone, a wide variety of languages. So please, please um, get yourself counted. <laughs> uh, and also because we don't know when we'll be opening again. Um, we also have a GoFundMe campaign to maintain our space and continue to meet our obligations while closed, but also to raise funds to be able to have events like this and programs like this, to be able to pay for books um, and continue um, just operating. So thank you all for coming. Uh, and now I'll just briefly introduce our special guest and our fabulous moderator. Um, so Felika Reed Benta is a Toronto-based writer whose debut short story collection, Crying Plantain, was long listed for the 2019 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Frank Plantain is currently nominated for the 2020 Forest of Reading Evergreen Award presented by the Ontario Library Association in addition to numerous other accolades, awards, and shout outs. Uh, she received an MFA in fiction from Columbia University, was a 2019 John Gardner Fiction Fellow at the Breadloaf Writers Conference, very cool, and is an alumnus of the 2017 Banff Writers Studio. She's currently working on a young adult fantasy novel drawing inspiration from Jamaican folklore Felika is the winner of 2019 by Black's People's Choice Award for Best Author. Uh, and our other author is Mira Jacob, who is the author of the critically acclaimed novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, um, but also good talk. Um, and um, so her recent work has appeared, and she also does some other writing, and so her recent work has appeared in the New York Times, Book Review, Vogue, Glamour, Tin House, Electric Literature, and Lit Hub. She lives in Brooklyn. And our moderator for the evening, Angela Bellas, who is a Pennsylvania-based writer artist who also has other fun hobbies that I, um, I won't read out. And um, I'm gonna stop talking now. Thank you everyone for coming. Just a brief note about the Q&A at the end. So at the bottom of your panel for um, participants, you'll see that there's a Q&A section. So please put any questions for the authors in there. Um, because that's where Angela will be able to pick, pick out the ones. So thank you so much. Um, I look forward to this. All right, um, great. So yeah, I do want to emphasize, um, definitely ask some questions because I think that would be even cooler than the questions I have coming forward. So that way we can get a real dialogue going. Um, but to start us off, Something I have been thinking about as we're kind of stuck in these weeks and months of limbo is time and thinking about how time really operates in stories and how you pick moments in time to show. And especially Salika, thinking about how in your book, um, you see these years go by of Kara's life. And so how do you decide what moments to show? And like, were there certain ages where you like, were like, have to get this down on the page. This is important to her character. Yeah, um, actually part of the reason why I did a short story collection was because I wanted to focus on specific moments in time and I didn't want to necessarily explain where she was for certain years, even though it's in chronological order. It goes from like when she's nine to when she's 13 and I didn't want to be like, and at 10 she was at this and because that wasn't really important. Um, I think the way that I decided to do it was I think in snapshots or I think in dialogue sequences. So I knew, for instance, 
questions for Snow Day, which is the second story, I was like, I just want to have black girls talk about their hair and what happens when it gets wet and like what it means and, you know, someone's hair is relaxed, someone's hair is braided. Like, I, I just want to have that down. And then I was like, what age would that like with that conversation. I mean, that's a conversation that happens throughout um, throughout our lives. But I was like, no, this is like, you know, she was nine here. When would this happen? Okay, I think she'd be around 13. So I think it was just more like, this is a moment that I want to do. Okay, now what age would she be when that moment happened? And so that's kind of how I worked the, the stories, even though I didn't write it chronologically, actually the last story is the story that I wrote first. So it kind of just was jumbled around and, and then it just ended up being chronological. <laughs> um, and yeah, is this kind of similar for you in choosing conversations and how, like, how, like, how's that choice and organization wise too? That's such a good question because um, Zalika, what you just said about, um, you sort of think in snapshots, right? You were saying that in kind of dialogue bursts. Um, I feel like I really, when you said that, I was like, yeah, I get that. I relate to that um, also because I think what you said about you're sort of gunning for a conversation um, between, you know, two black girls talking about their hair. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense to me too. Just because that's, I think that's always where I start to is like, what's the conversation? What's right. the talking about? And how do I get to the part that I most want to see on the page? How do I get to the juiciest part? Um, which is with the last book with Good Talk. Um, I remember kind of realizing, because I had done this really limited format. So the way that it's drawn, as you guys know, is um, the characters are just kind of paper dolls and their expression never changes. And I did that on purpose. And we can talk about that later, but because that's what they are, you don't get like, they don't telegraph emotion, right? They don't like cry and they don't laugh and they don't. Um, so I knew that it was all about the beats of the dialogue and then figuring out how to tell the exact dialogue to get the most emotional tension out of it was really what I was striving for. So um, so yeah, just to tell you how the structure happened, I think I thought of, you know, when I first pitched the book, it was supposed to be like, these are gonna be really funny conversations. They're gonna be so funny. It's 2015 and I still believe in America and this shit's gonna be funny. And then like everything happened and I was like, no, no, nothing's funny anymore. Nothing's funny. Um, and so that really changed the lens of the conversation. Um, and it really made me think about like which conversations are essential and also which conversations are the ones that are the ones about me doubting where my place is in the country. Um, and how do I kind of, how do I get to that? How do I get to how weird it is to be in a brown body in the, in this country um, that's so hostile to brown bodies? And how do I do that in a way that like doesn't, you know, how do I do that in a way that's like funny and painful because life as we know is pretty funny and painful. Yeah, so from beginning to end, are you thinking more about like emotion as you go through than like time jumps for you? Yeah, so like Zalika said that what she wrote for the chronologically, um, she's like that wasn't where it ended up in the book. So the way that I did mine um, was I wrote out 84 different conversations. I think maybe 40 something made it into the book. And then I did this cut. The, the first cut was if I was writing for something for vindication. Like, I was like, I can't put in any, any conversations that I'm just writing because I'm pissed off. So I had to cut all those. And then the next cut was really about like, what is the front structure and what is the back structure? So you see my son and I kind of in the A storyline getting older, he's getting older, he's understanding more about America. And you see me as a little kid also getting older. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's kind of, it was like a double helix structure, which is I think something that I end up doing a lot. Cool, cool. Um, and I think also like kind of going back to this origin story, I was reading that you had pitched this book um, not having done something like this before. So what is that process like, like hyping yourself up for a project you've never done? And then when you say, when they say, yeah, go for it. Like, are you your own hype lady? Do you have a crew? <laughs> it's really weird. So the thing that I didn't know how to do before I did this book was draw. Um, oh. was really weird for a book that is about drawing, um, <laughs> I drew. Um, and I knew how to draw like a little bit, but not on that level and, um, and not certainly in a kind of mass produced way. So I had to teach myself how to draw. I had to learn how to do illustrator and all that stuff, Photoshop and how to do InDesign and how to lay out a book. Um, but I can tell you guys, cause I bet we have a lot of people that are like writing or curious about writing and start projects and don't know where they're going. Um, if I would have started this project being like, first, you're going to teach yourself to draw. Then 
learn five different kinds of software. Then you're going to learn how to use all these tools. I probably would have been like, no, no, I'm just going to like watch Netflix. Cool. But, um, but because I just sort of, every time I was like, you know what, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. Like first teach yourself how to draw a nose. And I'd spend like three weeks on that. And I'd be like, now figure out how to like, you know, lay out a page. And I would spend weeks on that because it was just step by step. I think the thing that I learned is kind of anything is possible. Oh my God, I sound like a trainer, but I swear this is real. Anything's possible if you actually just do it in steps, right? If you don't tell yourself like the whole thing looks like this, if you're like, you know what, all I gotta do is go to class today, you can actually get it done. Um, I think like kind of like the, it's interesting the kind of support and help that we have, whether it's like these mindsets, these mantras, like just a little bit at a time or um, Zlika, in your acknowledgments, I love how much space you give to all the professors you've had and the help that you've had along the way. And so I was wondering if you could talk about like what that support looks like as a writer and also like maybe for anyone creative who's looking for a mentor, what should they be looking for? Yeah, for sure. Um, so de yeah, definitely teachers and mentors were a really big part of my um, my process in the sense that I wasn't really good at many other things than English when I was in school. I wasn't good at math. I wasn't good at science. Um, I was okay at like things like law and philosophy, but English was really what I wanted to do. And that was reflected in my report cards. Like you would see like my math grade and then you would see like my English grade. And um, I had a lot of discouraging uh, teachers as well. And if I didn't have my English teachers who were just kind of like, no, like you have a gift, you have a talent, like you want to be on the school newspaper, then um, I don't really, I mean, my, my, my mother and my family were very encouraging of me as well. So I don't think my mother would allow me to like give up or anything like that, but it would have been a lot that much harder. Um, so it started in high school for me, like with my writer's craft class and stuff like that, where I would just show my English teachers, you know, do you, I kind of wrote this thing, do you, do you think you could read it? And they'd be like, oh yeah, totally. Um, that's, that's fine. So I was very lucky in that sense. And then when I went to a uh, university, I knew, I knew that I wanted to be a writer from a very young age. Um, I was writing since I was very small. Um, my family says since I was three, uh, but I didn't really think that I could be a writer until I read Jamaica Kincaid by Annie, um, until I read Annie John by Jamaica Kincaid, um, because it was like kind of the first time I saw a black girl in a book and I was just like, oh, like, wow, you can write about these experiences. That's pretty cool. And, um, my mother, who's very much into education was just like, you know, there's degrees in creative writing, like you can do that. So I had a very clear plan when I was in high school, like one of these days, I'm gonna do a degree in creative writing. That's something I'm gonna do. So because I had that in mind and because my mother is very much into education, uh, we kind of came up with like these plans and I like wrote lists of um, all of the universities I was gonna apply to for my, for graduate school. I wasn't allowed to leave for undergrad because I was too young. Um, and so my mom was like, I don't know, like you're 17, I don't think so. Maybe like you can do grad school. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, so it was kind of like, the aspiration kind of like putting stuff on the wall being like I am going to get into one of these schools I am going to do this and so I did things like I joined um, uh, the school of continuing studies at my university at the time uh, they had a creative writing program so I joined that I joined any creative writing class that I could um, and so that helped now I actually work for an organization that does uh, mentorships and workshops for free because not everybody can have the, you know, ability to, to, to take a creative writing class. So, um, so yeah, that's something. And like, I know a lot of people, they just kind of create their own workshops. They kind of create their own groups. They kind of, or they look it up uh, in their communities just to be like, just type in creative writing groups or go on Facebook and something like that. So um, friends and family members are also really good um, to, to sort of like look at your work and stuff like that. I especially like going to friends because this, I, I don't know if it's just my friends, but despite what a lot of people say, they are not very nice. They're very harsh with their criticisms. So I know that I'm getting the truth. They don't really care about, um, about my feelings. And, um, 
And that's also something that I've, I've made sure to tell them because I'm just like, no, be, be brutally honest because I need, I need to know if this is going to work or not. And so I think in terms of what I found in my mentors is, is that they, found, they struck a very fine balance between not being terrible, like not being assholes, but being critical, mm -hmm. um, just being like, and that's something that, that was sort of a muscle that I learned as a writer as well, to know when someone is actually being critical and for the right reasons. And when someone is just like taking a dump on your work, just to take a dump on your work and like learning when to, to say yes to something and when to say no to something. And I think when you have the right mentors, um, they give you explanations for why they like cut out an entire page or why they say this isn't working. It's not just, it just wasn't working. They, they, they have something for you. In fact, uh, I had one instructor where he was like, tell me a book that you really like. And I was like, okay, Beloved by Toni Morrison. And he went home and he read the book so he could argue with me about things that I said that Toni Morrison didn't do that she did. He was like, on page so-and-so, this is what she does. You can do that too. So just finding someone who has that kind of commitment to not just to you, but to what good writing is, is I think something that, uh, that, that I have. I love that your professor did that. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> That's so good. Be like, you know what I'm going to make you do? Argue with me. I'm going to go read that and I'm going to make you argue with me. Exactly. And I wasn't expecting it. Like I, I remember walking down the hall and he stopped me and I wasn't even in his workshop that day. And he's like, I read that book and we're going to have a conversation about it because you're wrong. And I was just like, yeah. And I mean, not a lot of people, uh, he was a bit like he, I don't want to say combative, but we argued in class a lot. And I needed that as just the type of writer that I was because, and still am, because I'm stubborn and I, I think I'm right. And so I needed someone to be like, you're wrong and here's why. And, and some people need a gentler touch and that's totally fine. But I just know as the type of writer that I am, especially yeah. then when I like was first starting to write and very kind of precious with regards to my words and needing to keep every single thing, I needed someone to kind of just be a hard ass and that's what he was so yeah and also like just sort of yeah it's, I think it's really great to be interrupted on your own kind of literary mental turf you know what I mean we were like <laughs> I own this of it and it looks exactly like this and have someone be like actually I'm standing right here and it doesn't look like that <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. of that person is so good <laughs> um I yeah I also like can relate as the um, lack of math knowledge, I would say, like to start writing. And that's a, one of my favorite panels is where your mom says people who are bad at math are sad in life. And I'm like, she knew. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks <for> that. <laughs> um, and I like, and so as a kind of like fun question and thinking about um, Mira, I saw you're raising money for a literary organization and offering to do a personalized sketch. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Like, so if you and uh, Zlika, this is for you as well, could have any artist draw you in their style, who would you pick? Oh my God, that's such a great question. Okay, I think honestly who I'd want is, um, uh, and it would not be a, like, the thing that I love is that none of her characters are ever good looking, but um, do you know Linda Berry, the comic artist Linda Berry? So like all of her people look like kind of deranged cats. Um, <laughs> And I, and I love her style. If you guys don't, I don't know if the, um, if you guys that have just read my book, if you haven't read Linda Berry, there's this great, um, there's a great series that she does that's called, I think it's called The Life of Marlis. Um, and it's so good. And it completely inspired me when I first read it. And it definitely, you'll like see that there are things about it that sort of end up in good talk, like just little points of inspiration. But it's about this like tween girl who thinks she's amazing and the world does not think she's amazing and her mom does not think she's amazing and her older siblings and the like weirdos on her block and it's not like a clean sanitized world that we're sort of used to thinking like we have to build for tweens to read it's actually a pretty rough world like the grandmother's kind of abusive there's all sorts of drinking problems there's stuff there's like real stuff happening in this book but the person at the center of it is this is marlis who is just I mean, she just really likes herself and she likes herself in a way that the world is not telling her to like herself. And I just loved that idea of like, cause I do think 
honestly, I think like as girls, I feel like that's a lot of it, you know, like a lot of it, like if you, like a lot of going through the world is having people tell you all the ways in which you're unacceptable. And some part of you has to like hunker over that thing and be like, I'm great, you know? <laughs> I may look like a deranged cat, but there's something really good in here. So anyway, that was a long answer to your question, but yeah. Yeah, I love that. And Zlika, what about for you? I was thinking about it and actually uh, my friend, Ashley Haskell, she uh, does comics and um, she's an animator and I'm always really interested in what in how people who know me would like draw me or see me because I'm just kind of like, yeah, like I just want to know, I know how I look like, but you're like with me all the time. I want to know what you think I look like. Um, so I, <laughs> I, after this, I should be like, I want you to draw something of me. Just, just draw and I want to see what that, yeah, because I don't really, I, I was thinking about it and I feel so uninformed. I don't really know anybody um, of anybody else who I could think of at like, this moment who I'd want to, to draw me. Yeah. You know who I would want to draw you? I'm just looking at your face. Um, have you seen Emile Ferris's work? Have you ever looked at her work? No. Beautiful. Like, I feel like she would, I mean, I'm seeing you on Zoom, so whatever. <laughs> Could do justice to your cheekbones and your forehead. She does beautiful work and it's all crosshatch work. It's super cool. Huh. Yeah. yeah, she's also a graphic artist. That's my pick for you too. I'll just pick for everybody, okay? Yeah. There, there we go. We have that. This is and I think like part of like picking someone who can capture your essence, I think can like kind of lead us back to Mira and thinking like in your acknowledgments how you're like, sorry for the noises. <laughs> um, I love that apology, but also, um, and this is also a question from our readers, like how do you write about your family and your friends and how do you capture them in a way that does justice to what happened and how you feel, but also maybe balance their feelings as well. It's such a, it's such a good question. And, um, and actually, Lilika, when you were talking a little bit about um, when you sort of mentioned the thing of people that give you bad advice on your writing, right, and having to sort that out, it gets really complicated when those same people are the people that are in the writing, right? Mm -hmm. that, because their version of what is happening is like, is like, I didn't do that, or I don't want to have done that, or you have the wrong thing, or let me explain. But I do think that, um, I will say two things about that. One is, um, so the book is really about, um, it's about a lot of things, but it sort of culminates with my in-laws um, becoming ardent Trump supporters. And, um, and I was writing it in a moment when, um, and my father-in-law uh, died um, not too long ago, a few months ago, but I was writing it in a moment where he was very ill um, and where our family was really falling apart and it felt really unfair to write about it. Like the kind of immigrant good girl side of me was like, this is not the moment. This is not the moment. And I was like, okay, yeah, but this man just elected a racist president and he's got a brown grandson. And like, I've been in this family for 20 years and suddenly they don't see me. Like suddenly it's okay for them to do this. Like when is the moment? It was really hard, but I had to do this thing when I was writing, which is that I wrote, as I told you, I wrote all the scenes and some of them were really angry because um, it really hurts to be in a family for 20 years and then have people that suddenly don't see you. Or if they do see you, they think you're making it up because they've never experienced, you know, that kind of great thing of like, I've never experienced racism. So it's clearly a country that doesn't exist or I would have been to it. Um, and so I had to kind of ask myself over and over again are you writing this for clarity? Meaning, are you writing this because you're trying to figure out something and, and in the writing, in the course of the writing, you have unearthed the thing you were trying to figure out? Or are you writing it for vindication? Meaning, are you writing it so this goes into the world and a bunch of people can be like, your in-laws suck. And you can be like, yeah. <laughs> because also, um, because those are my husband's parents and those are my son's grandparents. And they are also really good parents and grandparents to my you know, son and my husband. So I had to kind of interrupt myself over and over. And that was, the, that was sort of the stick that I used was if I was writing it for vindication, I just had to cut it. I mean, I wrote it, I would write it and I'd be like, yeah. And then I would cut it. Um, and then in terms of putting it out in the world, um, I sent it to everybody. Um, I it was already in galleys. Uh, which means just so we like, just for the process, what that means um, is there's before you publish your book, it, it comes in a kind of bound version, which is a galley. You can correct things, you can change things, not that much, but you can a bit. 
And I sent it to everybody because I was like, I want you to know what I've written. And in my head, I was like, if they say, absolutely not, this can't go in, then I've got to have a conversation with them about it. And mm -hmm. I've got to say like, you know what I mean? And we'll have to explore what that looks like and some version of what is true for all of us. And then, uh, but I sent it to them and they didn't because I didn't write anything that wasn't true. Um, and I didn't write a lie. I think it was painful for them and it's painful for me to write it, but I don't feel like anyone thought that I'd like done a hatchet job or lied. Yeah. Um, bold and brave to mail the galleys and just kind of. I like mailed the galleys and then I ducked. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think also like, I like a lot of the stories with, um, Zlika, thinking about those moments of tension that really exist between Kara and her mom and Kara and her grandma and how like there's so much love underneath that, but the it doesn't erase the tension. And I think that kind of, you know, a different tension certainly than perhaps was happening with your in-laws, of course. Um, but um, what was it like kind of writing these tense moments in? Was this something that was drawn from family experiences or something totally made up? Like how, how much of your life is kind of appearing in your stories? Uh, my life appears in the sense that everywhere Kara lives, I've lived mm -hmm. um, in that sense. And my mother and grandmother are very strong-willed women in that sense. Um, but I also just grew up watching a lot of teen dramas <laughs> Um, and watching a lot of just dramatic movies and dramatic television. And I was always very drawn to the tensions that I saw like on screen. And I wanted to kind of do my own version of that and like root that in Jamaican, Jamaican Canadian culture. Um, so, and I, I really like tensions because I find that um, I like playing with the idea that you find love in the tensions. The reason why everything is so tense is because these women love each other. They just can't express it in a way that the other woman receives or can understand and and so it, it becomes very complicated um and so like there's this kind of hyper surveillance of Kara and what she wears and what she says and how she like navigates the world and it's it's done because her mother is just she understands the world better than Kara she understands systemic racism better than Kara at that point because she's lived through it and um you know racism in Toronto and racism in Canada is, is very subtle. Um, it's, it's very much just like a look or, you know, being followed around in the store or something like that. Something that you can't quite articulate to other people. And even at a young age, you know, something is wrong. You feel something is wrong. You feel like you're being singled out, but you can't quite articulate what that is. And, you know, there's also um, a bit about sexual harassment in my book. And so like, you know, um, so when she's being surveyed, it's just because her mother's trying to be like, I just, I want you to be as safe as possible. I'm trying to safeguard you as much as possible, but it really just comes across in a very different way to Kara at that time. And, you know, with the grandmother, um, Brenna and Eloise, the mother and their tensions, it's just kind of like, you know, um, Eloise was a, was a teenage mother and Verna came to Canada to, to kind of give a better life and this kind of happens. And so dreams that she had are kind of shattered at that moment and the way that she takes that out and she's, she's sad. I feel like she's sad for her daughter or she's sad that her daughter has to go through the hardships that she's going through. But sadness isn't something that this family communicates. Sadness translates to anger because anger he can use, anger he can do something with. Um, and so, so that just becomes a whole other thing. So through these tensions is actually just kind of unuttered words of love that no one can say. And I found that super fascinating to write. And so I was just kind of like, yeah, that's, that's really, really great. And so sometimes if I speak to other people, sometimes people get it. Like sometimes they're just like, yes, I totally understand. Like this sounds like my family, like I totally, totally get it. And other people are just like, oh my God, these characters are so toxic. And I'm like, I don't think they're toxic. I just think that they're, um, that toxic things have happened to them and they have to, they have to learn how to work it out and they're working it out the best they can, but they're also trying to survive in this society. So it just creates this whole other kind of dynamic between all three women um, and sometimes the grandfather. So I thought that was, uh, yeah, it was just really interesting and fun to write. 
Can I ask a question about that, about the toxicity? And Andy, I, Angela, I want to ask you this too. When someone describes your characters as toxic, like right when they have like a pop culture take on your characters, what do you do with that? Like, where does that land in you? Oh, um, it irritates me, but I generally just kind of, because it's, it's like, if it's, if it's someone who, who says it to me, like if I'm at like a festival or something like that, then I can just be like, okay, wait, like, hold on. Let's like, let's unpack this for a second. If it's in like on Goodreads or something like that, I kind of just have to learn to ignore it. Like, I'm not going to respond to everybody being like, actually, they're not toxic. Um, I'm just kind of like, um, that I think something that I really had to learn and something I was preparing myself for is that when you put your book out in the world, it's other people are going to have interpretations of it. Like it's, it's kind of like a public thing now. It is a public thing. So, so I don't begrudge them for their interpretation of my work, even if I think that it's wrong. It's, and, and sometimes it's kind of, I, I struggle with that because I know what I'm trying to say and they're not quite getting it or they're getting something completely different. But at the same time, I mean, my work is not just mine anymore. It's something that they're consuming. And so, so yeah, that's just something that I'm still kind of going through, but that's kind of how I like respond to it, where I'm just kind of like, well, I mean, that's, yeah. That's yeah. I feel like, um, I just think like, oh, you just didn't, you didn't get it. You didn't get my character. Like you think you did. And I also like this weekend reading interviews, like I read someone who like, you know, they had said like, oh, Kara's compassionate, unlike her mom. And I was like, whoa. And I think like <laughs> her mechan like people, like the toxic maybe characteristics that people might point to are mechanisms that we have put where our characters have put in place um, mm -hmm. because of the way that the world operates around them and that they need to exist. And so like to understand the character is to understand how maybe they exist in their world. And so you can't understand the world um, if you don't understand the world, you can't really understand the character. And so then they become this kind of like villain, flat villain of sorts. Exactly. I, which also brings uh, another point where I also look at the person who's saying it and I'm just like, do you understand how racism works? Do you understand how sexism works? Do you understand how misogyny works? Do you understand how a black woman or a woman of color is going to operate in this world and the defense mechanisms or the coping mechanisms that they may use to navigate this world? So that's also something that I take into consideration. I'm like, who am I speaking to or who's speaking to me when they're saying these things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, and I think also like so much, especially with your characters, the kind of, a lot is kept in secret. And so like the reader knows the secrets and Kara's slowly starting to figure out the secrets. But I was wondering, like in the process of writing this book, did you discover any secrets about yourself? Um, I discovered that I'm very scared of putting emotion on the page, even if it's not my emotion. It's something that, um, for the longest time, I wouldn't give my characters catharsis, and I didn't know why. And everyone's just like, you're just, it's just, it's so tense, and you're not giving them any type of release. Like, why is that? And, um, and then I had to think about it, and I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm not giving my characters any kind of release. I, I, I wonder what's going on with that. And so then that kind of made me think about how I deal with my own emotions. And basically it felt like I was holding my characters hostage because I couldn't work out whatever was going on with me. And so it's like, it, it seems super weird to say because they're not real, but it's like, it's not fair to my characters if I'm not, um, you know, getting right with how I process my own things because I'm also getting into the heads of other people, I have to view my characters as if they're real. So they're gonna have real emotions and they're gonna have real processes. And if I can't even like work out what's going on with me, whatever that may be, then how am I expected to write it for other people? So um, so yeah, it, it kind of just became like this other kind of process for me and, and how to like be more in touch with my emotions and more in touch with myself. So that's what I learned about myself. And Mira, was that kind of similar for you, especially like revisiting your teen self um, as an adult? Like, did you gain any kind of new insight about <laughs> being a teenager? And is there anything you might want to like tell your younger self? 
Oh my God, I talk to my younger self all the time. I've drawn comics of my older self talking to my younger self. I should send you one. It's literally my older self talking to my younger writer self. My younger writer self was like, I am going to be a poet and I'm going to write five books tomorrow, you know? And it was <laughs> like, well, that's a thing. Um, and, it, and it's older me being like, so listen, don't worry when the world doesn't want your work at first, like keep going. And she's like, why wouldn't the world want my work? You know, because <laughs> the youngest you was like, I am so good. Um, or the youngest me was anyway. Um, did I learn anything about myself? I mean, I guess I learned, which I didn't think, um, which I didn't, I always thought that I would be way too scared to write a book like the one that I did. Um, I thought I was more protective of the people in my life and I thought that I felt too wrong about most things to hold an opinion um, enough to keep it on a page that about my own life. I feel like when I'm in a novel, when I'm in the, confi like the confines of a novel, I feel like I can do much more um, and take bigger emotional risks and get away with it um, because, because of the catharsis actually, because I kind of look forward to that. I didn't think I could do that with um, memoir and I didn't think I could write. I was really scared when I was writing because I didn't know how it was gonna end. And it occurred to me at some point, I was like, I don't know how to end this. And I've just asked all these questions and I don't know how to solve them. And I remember the night that I was like, oh my God, you wrote a book and you didn't solve racism? Okay, <laughs> you're just gonna have to live with that shit. <laughs> Having that moment. And being and kind of being like, all right, so um, yeah, you're just gonna have to like, you're just gonna have to say all the true things that you know, and leave them on the page, and know that maybe at some point later in your life you're gonna be like, that one I should have done differently. And I think that's what it means to write um, a memoir. Is your the thing you're exposing the truth about is something you might change your mind on, and getting and knowing that that's that's something that you can live with. Um, is interesting. Like coming to terms with that idea is something that uh, was pretty interesting for me. Flexible truth. Yeah, or just like knowing, you know what I mean? Like we're in such a, I feel like we're in a time where it's um, rightly people are furious for many reasons and what they want to do is find the enemy because actually the, the real enemy is so hard to, to actually reach in any way. So it's so much easier to be like, you're the enemy because you said this thing wrong and you're the enemy because you have this assumption and you're the enemy. And I, and when I was writing this book, I was like, so like in two years, people are going to rip this up and be like, this is evidence that this person is super messed up inside. And this is, you know, like, because our thoughts change and because we grow and that's necessary. And like getting okay with that, being like, at some point you're going to be the punchline because you dared to put work out in the world that was about race. At some point, someone's going to turn around and like knock your teeth out for a bad thing you said, a thing that was unthinking that you might have grown past and they're gonna need to knock your teeth out. And I was like, well, that's just, I gotta live with it. You know, I never thought that I would, I never thought I would choose to do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think this leads to a larger question of kind of like reception. And so like, what's a surprising, maybe in a good way, reception, like um, reader comments you've gotten or something fun that's happened at a book reading or something or surprising? Um, so my favorite thing that has happened, uh, when I, when, it's funny when there, first when reviews were coming out, um, I was nervous because they kept placing the book. It was kept being about whiteness. It kept being about like, this is about racism and how white people are doing the right things. And I was like, that's really not what this book is about. And then, and then when I went to readings, it was all these like brown teenagers coming out of the woodwork to be like, it's about me. And I was like, it's about you, you know, and like, and a lot of mixed race, like families and, and the, like the huge swath of America that this book is about, that is not, has nothing to do with whiteness and has nothing to do with Trump, it has everything to do with being in a body that nobody seems to recognize as a body, having like a life that, that you never see represented anywhere. So it feels, your life feels more like fiction than somebody else's fiction, right? Um, and so that part of like seeing all those people and having them come to the readings and, and having them tell me their stories, that was wild and really exciting. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I guess I have two things. One thing is that I knew when I wrote this book that I wanted um, Black Jamaican girls or Black Caribbean girls in Canada, specifically Canada to feel represented. Um, so that was something that I was like, 
it wasn't like at the forefront of my mind because it, it it's just kind of like in everything in my book like i make sure it's very specific to toronto very specific toronto slang very specific all these different things um and so just getting the reception that that i did that um was was surprising in the sense that like wow like i actually managed to do what i wanted to do so like um on instagram there is this this girl who was just like, I grew up like right at that street and I have never read a book that so accurately described what it feels like to grow up in this neighborhood. And I was like, oh my God, yes. And um, I went to like this uh, book club uh, for teen, like the, these teenage girls, it was um, like a well-read black girl book club in, 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 um, in, in a suburb. And they gave me this kind of like, treasure box thing with like notes of what of how much my book like inspired them or what it meant to them and I was like oh my god this is so amazing um and so like I was so emotional and like I've already kind of discussed I'm, I'm not really an emotional person so getting that emotional was just like oh my god uh this is this is so great another thing that was super surprising and I and I kind of got a little bit about this in workshop was how many women responded to my story snow day um, responded to the bullying and responded to the sexual harassment and how many women came up to me being like yeah like this kind of happened to me when I was 14 and like you know this kind of happened to me and like oh yeah I remember my bully her name was so and so and she did this to me and so like this kind of every time I go somewhere there's always at least one woman who comes up to me being like yes snow day if I redo a reading and I ask um which story do you want me to read it's always snow day so i was just like i just didn't expect that story to be the story that would resonate with with the people that read my book so um so that's always that's always something that I, even though i've i've become accustomed to it even if I, I i when i go it's still surprising to me how many people are just like yes snow day um yeah so so that's probably your first question um that's so cool and that treasure box sounds that's yeah. really beautiful yeah, yeah, it was. Definitely was. Was not expecting it. it wasn't even, ex and it was really funny because, um, like, when they were asking me questions, they were just like, how do you get, like, teen voices so, so right? I'm like, okay, okay. I wasn't a teen, like, so long ago, guys. Like, it's, I still feel like it's, it's not like, yeah. And so they're like, oh, okay. Because, like, we say these kinds of things now, and I'm just like, how old do you think I am? And this book is like what? Um, so that like that was it's always really funny for me when I when I actually get to do things like this and like speak to speak to teens and, and hear what they have to say about my book and yeah so so that's also pretty great. Cool. Um, and then I guess pulling out outside of the books, what are the kinds of what books are you reading? What are your obsessions? What's getting you through these times? Right now, I'm actually reading The Bells by Danielle Thing. It's amazing. I can't wait to read the second one. Um, and I'm, al I'm also writing young adult fiction right now. I mean, Brian Planton, I didn't write it thinking it was going to be young adult. I just kind of wrote it. And then uh, my publishers were like, hey, this is like cross market appeal. And I was like, cool. Uh, so then it also kind of became a bit way. But this I am intentionally writing for younger audiences here. And so I'm also just reading books that I used to read and books that like, uh, my friends' younger siblings have told me to read, and so so the bells is what I'm reading right now, and it's, it's pretty it's pretty great. Um, okay, so like the rest of uh, America, I feel like I read both of Octavia Butler's um, the Parables of the Sower and Parables of Talents. Um, I think I had read them in high school, but I don't think I absorbed them honestly. I think it was just like I think I was so nervous about the world that um, it just shut me down. Like I read it and I was, I think I read it in like a, in a sweat of nervousness um, and both of them. And so that was kind of amazing. And then recently my friend, um, Caitlin uh, Greenidge, who's also in the, in Good Talk, um, she's coming out with a new book called Liberty. Um, and I read that to blurb it. And it was just like getting lost in a whole world. It was so awesome. It was great. Um, so I was reading, and then uh, the only other thing, I feel really bad saying this, but I'm working on television stuff right now. So I've just been watching a lot of half hours of television, trying to figure out like what the, what the kind of 
conversational rhythm is in those um, to kind of build a half hour to kind of see how that really how the ebb and flow is. The only the only way I know how to make something is to sort of take it apart and then try to build it back together myself. So I've just been doing that. Cool. And Kaylin Greenridge, she wrote We Love You, Charlie Freeman. Is that? Yes. yes. Such a good book. Good book. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's amazing. She's amazing. Um, okay. So now we have some fun grab bag questions from our audience. Um, what soundtrack would you put to your books? A signature song, perhaps. All right. It's like, you got to go first. <laughs> um, considering okay I have like a few like I actually I actually listened to these songs while I was writing my book so it's a lot of like old school dance halls so like a lot of Tanto Metro and Devante everybody falls in love sometimes a lot of old Sean Paul like get busy um a lot of like Mr. Vegas heads high so so yeah I was just basically going through like my old rigged gold CDs of like the 90s <laughs> so uh, and, or like streaming those kinds of songs. So yeah, so there's there's that, and then there's also like, and some of it is referenced in my in my book. So I would listen to like a lot of Aaliyah, a lot of Ja Rule, a lot of Fifty Cent, like a lot of just early two thousands uh, hip hop and R and B and reggae and, and some nineties because that's that's the time um, that the book takes place in. And these and that's what the characters would be listening to. That's so good. Um, okay, so I have a really, um, I have a very old person answer, but it'd be an old person even for me, uh, answer, which is that, um, so the, I, so I would actually, it would, it would probably be a lot of Bee Gees because that is like the soundtrack of New Mexico in the 70s and 80s. Like, New Mexico just didn't catch up. New Mexico just was never like on the cutting edge of anything. So the Bee Gees were just always playing everywhere all the time in New Mexico. And specifically, I have a really weird fondness for that song, How Deep Is Your Love? Like, <laughs> really listen to that song an absurd amount. So if we have to go down to a specific song, it's probably that song. That's really funny. Well, also to think of cities as having, or states as having a soundtrack as well. Um, I often think about Eurovision and, and what that would look like here. If, if... <laughs> <laughs> so bad. So troubling. <laughs> um, all right. So then someone is asking, have you ever gotten writer block? And if so, how did you deal with it? Oh, man. I got so, like, so many different periods of time, um, especially during my collection, because I was a perfectionist writer in the sense that if I did not like a sentence, I was not writing anything else. So I had to perfect that one sentence. Uh, and that can get you into writer's block because if you get into your mind way too much, like it doesn't have to be perfect. And that's something that I have to keep telling myself even now where I'm just like, I don't like the sentence. You're like, nope, we're not doing what we did before. We're gonna keep going because you can go back. You can always go back. And that was what, another reason why I went to an MFA program because you have deadlines or you're not going to graduate. So I needed, I needed that. I needed to be like, well, I have workshop next week, so I got to get this done. Um, so that's kind of how I did it. And then when I left um, school, because my, my collection wasn't done when I was in school, um, I didn't write for like, I didn't write that book for like two years because I needed space. I needed time. I spent like about four years, like two years before my grad school and two years in grad school, just writing it. And I was like, I'm sick of it. I just, I don't want to do it anymore. And sometimes time taking a step away is what you need to get over your writer's block. And I was fortunate to go to the BAM center, uh, which is, um, a center for, for artists of like every kind of musicians, dancers, um, costume makers, writers, and I didn't write while I was there, but just being amongst other artists did something because the day I got back from being there, and I was there for five weeks, and I did not write for five weeks. I kind of just took everything in, but I wrote like five stories in like four weeks, which was nuts for me when it could take me a year to write a story, and, and then my collection is finished. So I'm sorry that I don't have like specific things of what to do, but for me, it was really just time and learning to kind of get over myself with my perfectionism. Mm -hmm. So the way that I talk myself back into writing, I always feel like um, I really relate to that. Um, so again, also, I 
I'm so, I'm, I'm like beyond flabbergasted with five stories in four weeks or whatever you just said, four are like, that's incredible. That's incredible. It never happened again, but yes. <laughs> yeah, it happened. Um, I love the idea of it just like all being in you and being like, Whoop, there it is. Um, what I do, I find that when I get writer's block, part of what's happening is that I'm getting scared of writing because I'm not writing. And then I get in this weird cycle of being scared because I'm not writing. So then I don't write more. So then I don't, then I get more scared. So part of it to me is actually just setting up a doable goal, which sounds really silly, but that's what it is. So it's like, I'm going to write for 10 minutes today. I'm just writing for 10 minutes. And if I write for 10 minutes, I'm like, I'm the champion of the universe. I just wrote for 10 minutes. I just wrote for 10 minutes. And then I keep that up for like five days and I'm like, now go to 20 minutes. And I think once I get something down on the page, it's like putting furniture in a room. You can find your way around it again. Like you learn, you remember how to sit, you remember how to be, but those first, those first parts are really unnerving. So for me, it's just about kind of showing up and just putting something down so that I have guideposts going forward and just knowing that it's not going to feel, I also just know in my writing, nothing I write feels real or good or interesting or even vaguely like, I just, it's, I, it's embarrassing to me until like the fourth or fifth pass and somewhere around the fourth or fifth pass. I'm like, okay, so this is good. You know, something else, um, depending on what you're writing is if I don't feel like writing, this isn't quite writer's block, but if I just, if it's just not happening, because I admire people who are like, I'm going to sit and write for 10 minutes a day. I'm going to sit and write for this because I don't do that. If I don't feel like writing, I don't write. Um, but if I don't feel like writing and I feel guilty because I'm not writing, I research. Um, or I do a mood board. So like right now I'm writing fantasy. So I just look up all these different artworks and stuff on Pinterest and just like do things because it's for my book. I'm writing, I'm not writing writing, but I'm doing something that's going to help me with my book. Or I read, or I just do something that isn't actually writing, but related to what I'm doing to make it to, to be working. So that's also something. Yeah, I also like um, setting a very small non-writing achievable goal so you feel like a champion it's like oh if I make the spaghetti and it's so amazing then surely I can write a paragraph like just kind of yeah. typing yeah. up or like if I run this block and I run like these five blocks two seconds faster wow I'm so good and, and then that feels like enough to get over that scary hump of like not being able to write I love the idea of taking something unrelated and being like you know what this means I'm also good <laughs> and I've learned to supply myself with it <laughs> um okay so um what speaking of outside writing jobs um what do you do for fun outside of writing and how does that inform your books oh Maybe boy your closing question yeah I cook which doesn't sound like fun, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and I make fan videos of like ships on shows and stuff like that. I like to. What's the I actually latest like, one you made? Hmm? What's the latest one you've made? Latest one is actually like from an old show. It's from the Vampire Diaries. I like Stefan and Elena. So I make Stefan and Elena videos um, because I have like so many of their YouTube clips and everything that I just piece them together. Um, I like making things and so I like just making videos to songs and stuff like that and I didn't know that I liked making videos until like the 11th grade when I took a media class and they were just like you have to make a video and I was just kind of like okay and I was like this is amazing I love doing this and so like since then so like yeah since like high school I've just been making fan vids because they're fun. It's amazing. Um, okay, so that I'm uh, the one th the thing that I was doing until my until my bandmate moved recently to California was um, you know there's a section in Good Talk where it's like my brother gives all of my bad exes country western song titles so like you could have been my lover if you would have had a liver and those my panties but that was my heart like that section I had a country western band where we made songs to all those titles like I have a whole list of them so we would write songs to those and perform them and that was really fun and silly and ridiculous and kind of amazing and I really loved it. Did you perform like for your friends at a bar? Uh... For my friends we you know we were kind of amping up to do it for my paperback launch we were like let's do it let's do it let's do it let's have like a little like a mini concert of all these songs and then, um, and then the pandemic happened and we were like, hmm, 
There it goes. We were, I think, I think honestly, it was probably just like intervention. It was like divine intervention of like, don't, that's actually it's a terrible idea. <laughs> Sorry for it. <laughs> um, all right. And <laughs> that's divine. Yes. Um, I guess takeaways here, like any, t uh, like one tip for being like, more creative or kind of like getting yourself like started like if there's like one takeaway you would say for for our readers yeah um okay so i mine would be um instead of trying to think of like all the things i said this in the beginning instead of trying to think of like all the things you have to do to get a project done break it down into some small thing and do the small thing and just keep doing the small thing i wrote my first book for 10 years between the hours of 11 and one, cause I was sort of failing upward through corporate America and I had a child and it was just like a nightmare, but I just showed up for that person. And if I wouldn't have done it, if I wouldn't have shown up and just done the small thing little by little, I never would have gotten that book done. And that did change my life. So I think just show up for yourself and do the small doable thing that you can do. And every time you do it, that's huge. I don't really know if I can top that. Um, it's because that's kind of like what I would say as well. I think that um, I think that there's so many, you can give yourself so many reasons why not to do something. Um, so give yourself reasons to do something or just do it. Just, you know, like the worst that can happen is that you don't like what you did, but at least you did it. So I'm basically just kind of piggybacking off of what Mira said. Um, and I also think in that respect, I don't know if this is about like being more creative, but um, don't be so hard on yourself if it's not exactly right the first time. Don't be so hard on yourself if it's not coming out in the time that you want it. There's one thing I could tell myself is like, it doesn't have to happen in a year. It doesn't have to happen in two years. You can set your deadline for yourself, but you can extend that deadline. Like it's totally fine to take your time. Um, you know, there's no rush. So I think that's something that um, I just like to tell um, people who are writing and, and, and want to get further with their writing. It's just like, just, you know, honestly, be kind to yourself and take your time because it's going to take as long as it takes. And if you don't want to create something that is not what you wanted just because you wanted to get it done quickly. So, so that's something that I would say. Cool. I think that's, I think that's really beautiful. Both of those pieces of advice. What's your advice? What's my advice? Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, I think like just really, um, I like the one step at a time, but, uh, but also thinking of someone once said that drafting is like, you're just putting the sand in the bucket. You're not building the castle yet. Mm -hmm. And that is what I kind of have to think about. Like, it's just a sentence. It's not, it's not going to be final. It's not going to be a final paragraph. I'm just collecting sand and maybe rocks and maybe sticks. But like, at a later point, it will become the castle <laughs> of sorts. I haven't even started building the castle yet and kind of giving myself that kind of um, leeway of sorts. And I think also like coming from an editor, like an editorial background, I can just kind of, it's like constantly running through my mind. So kind of being able to turn that off. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And when is your book out? Um, so winter 2022. Woo! Wow. Okay, what's the title just so I can, so um, I so, uh, uh, not, it's like unofficial so far. Just, okay. um, <laughs> Mike, we're hearing a secret that might not be. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> So coming soon. Okay. I can and yeah, it'll be official soon, but I feel I'm like in that weird limbo of sorts. So. Okay. Well, we will look forward to it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that we've reached our end of the hour. I don't know if um, Memphis wants to hop back in and kind of close us out. We're thinking about, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much to 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 you to you all to you three. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories, your processes, your advice. Um, we're really grateful. You know, our group is like 
such a, this is like our first time doing this um, series and it's been such an amazing time and it's really been enriched by the fact that we have, you know, such a large list of wonderful writers to choose from, but like that we landed on such great books and we're also so fortunate to be able to actually have you all. And thank you for letting us record this so we can share it with our members who were unable to make it yeah. um, and with other people in the community. Um, and so really, really thank you so much. Um, we have another event happening August 28th. It's our final event where um, we'll have um, Natalia Sylvester, Lilian Rivera, um, and, uh, Elizabeth Acevedo, uh, Angie will be um, moderating. There's another person who, whose book we'll be reading whose name I'm forgetting. So that's a big oopsies. But, um, uh, you know, La Maslet has really been like a, a, great, a great experiment and really appreciate for you participating and joining us on this experiment and sharing with us in this author talk. So thank you. Thank you to our guests and Jen DeLeon, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and um, Andy for, thank you, I'm sorry about that. Um, and Carolina, a um, colleague of mine has dropped in more information about the program, if you're curious, but um, uh, those, are, those are the words in conclusion, I guess. <laughs> All right, thank you, bye, please take care. Yes.